So hi everyone, my name is Carmel Granahan and I'm the Customer Success and Partners Lead here in OnePage CRM. And I'm delighted to welcome you to today's sales talk on email marketing as your secret sales weapon. And I'm even more excited to be joined by uh, Danielle de Sarzand, who's the, um, who's the Senior Product Marketing Manager of Tech Partnerships at MailChimp. So MailChimp is a all-in-one marketing platform. It's probably one of the leading ones. So I'll just pass you to Danielle to say hi, and thank you for joining us. Hello, everyone. So happy to be a part of this today with our partners at OnePage CRM. Um, I have a background um, that's pretty unique. I started off in the cable television industry doing sales and marketing um, in that capacity and then transitioned over into the amazing ESP world um, in 2019. So super excited to be here and speak about marketing strategies as it relates to email. Brilliant. Um, yes, and I'm really looking forward to, to getting going as well, Danielle. And before we jump right in, I just want to introduce as well um, Sarah Shueki, who's our Senior Customer Success Champion in OnePage CRM. So Sarah will be there um, doing all good things with the questions in the chat. Yeah, thanks, Carmel. Thanks for the intro. Hi, everyone. I'm here to answer all of your questions on the chat today. So do keep me busy and um, I'll speak to you on the chat. Thanks, Carmel. Thanks, Danielle. Brilliant. Okay, so without further ado, let's get going. So a few points we're going to be covering on today's session is the first thing is how to align um, your sales and marketing teams. Um, and here we're going to be sharing some insights into how good and, mark good and bad marketing alignment can affect your business. Um, and I'll also share my own experience when it comes to this. Um, next, we'll be um, showing you the problems or talking about the problems that SMBs are experiencing with email marketing. So we'll be discussing some of the, the key problems um, and also giving you tips on how to resolve them. And I think a few people already had some questions there that I think we'll, we'll be answering. So Danielle's expertise will come in super handy um, for that section. And then moving on to the how to launch a successful marketing campaign. So sometimes people you know you want to do a marketing campaign, but you just maybe don't know where to start or what what um, stages you should be following. So we'll be talking you through all of those um, and how each one works. And then we'll be giving you a quick summary of the key takeaways from today's session. So we're also recording the session. So um, we'll be following up with anyone who attends with um, an email afterwards. So keep the questions coming and um, we'll, we'll get going. Um, so one of the first things that comes to mind um, about sales and marketing misalignment is that um, when the two teams are not aligned, there's lots of um, things that are impacted by this. So one of the stats that really stand, that stood out to me was that when they're not aligned, 60 to 70% of B2B content created is never used by sales reps. So 60 to 70%, which is pretty huge. And if you think about it, um, your marketing team spend a lot of time on creating content, uh, you know, research, design, and then, you know, it may be put up on the website, but maybe the sales team don't even know about it. So there's also a major cost involved in, in doing this as well. So my, my advice to you would be today to ask uh, two questions. So number one, does your sales team uh, know about this content that you have? Or number two, which is even probably a little bit worse, do they know about this content, but they don't think it's relevant and they don't feel that they can use it when trying to sell um, to, their, to their audience or to their prospects. Um, so it's a good thing to think about when you are creating that market, those marketing materials. And the second point that was really interesting as well was um, that sales reps actually ignore 50% of marketing leads. So 50% um, is, is really high, you know, it's middle of the road. Um, but here again is, is it that the marketing team again are not attracting the right type of leads? Um, maybe they're bad quality. So uh, a few questions here to ask your team is, do they have experience of um, following up with these leads and just that they never converted? Or um, do they have different, do, does your sales and marketing teams have different of ideas of what a marketing qualified lead is and what a um, sales qualified lead is? So maybe that's the, the point there they need to discuss. Um, you know, it's not just about getting, getting leads, leads, leads in. It's also evaluating the quality of those leads. 
So if you're if you um, can associate with any two of those points, you know, stay tuned because we're going to uh, talk to you a little bit about solving those points. Um, of course, there is a plus and there's a flip side as well. So when marketing and sales teams are aligned, um, you see huge results. So um, one study showed that when sales and marketing teams are in sync, companies become or became 67% better at closing. So that's huge, like it's, it's massive. Um, so this shows that when there is a shared responsibility for driving revenue in the company, um, you do see the results. And as well as attracting the right audience, um, maybe also those sales reps are using the content and that's what's helping as well to, to close those deals. Um, and the second study, which was really um, a really good one as well, and something that's really, we could probably delve into this topic um, in a whole sales talk in itself, but it's customer retention. Um, so another study found that organizations with tightly aligned sales and marketing functions enjoyed 36% higher customer retention rates. So that, like, that's, that's amazing. Um, and it's interesting here as well is that it actually costs five times um, as much to attract a new lead than it is to keep an existing one, or to, sorry, to attract a new customer um, than it is to keep an existing one. So if you're planning to, um, and also if you're planning to launch a new product or service, your existing clients are twice as likely to, to buy from you um, that product or service because the trust is already um, built up. So um, they're just kind of a few points of how you can do it right and how you can do it wrong. And how can we get um, sales and marketing on the same team? So I just, I'm going to share four uh, tips with you. Um, one, one quick saying I heard recently, and it was from Nadia in our marketing team. She had it in one of her posts and it said, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So I think that kind of sums up the power of um, your sales and marketing teams uh, getting aligned. Um, so delving into the four tips. So the first one is get talking. Um, I worked in a, an insurance company in the past and it was almost like we were two completely separate, nearly companies. Um, I was in the marketing team and then there was a sales team. So there was only uh, two of us in marketing and six on the sales team. And basically it all, we actually were brought together because we had to des design a landing page for a new um, product that was being launched. And there was lots of emails flying back and forth and nobody really understood what the other team was doing or what they, where they were coming from. So we actually called a meeting. And uh, as you can imagine, like um, it was the insurance industry and it was in the car insurance industry as well. So um, at the beginning, there was lots of talking over each other and 15, 20 minutes in, it was, it was tough. But once we uh, righted that out, um, we actually started to talk. And so what I found out was, you know, I asked some questions like, um, how many check-ins uh, do you usually do with the prospect? You know, what language do you use? Uh, what does the customer look like? So what, what's your ideal customer? Um, do you use email templates when you're, when you're following up with them? Um, and so I found out so much at that discovery meeting and it really kind of helped, uh, helped us move that project forward and move it in the right direction as well. Um, so it definitely gave us a better insight and it, it made sure that we were both thinking about the end goal, which is the customer, because that's really what you're trying to do here. You're trying to, you know, convert as many customers as you can. So definitely get talking. Uh, if you're calling that first meeting, whether, well, maybe it's not so easy now if you're doing it online, but definitely bring some donuts, you know, it's the, always a sweetener um, and get the conversation started. Uh, the second tip we'd have for you is map out your buyer's journey. So look at maybe five or six key things. Um, the first one is think about how you generate your leads. Are they on your website? Um, are you doing campaigns on social media, online events, advertising? So find out where you get your leads and then decide what should happen once you get that lead. So what's the next step? Does marketing qualify them first or does it go straight to the sales team and they need to qualify them? So this will depend on your organization. Uh, think about how you're going to nurture that customer so, or nurture that prospect into a customer. So are you going to maybe set up a campaign, an email marketing campaign, get them engaged and then pass it over to the sales team? Um, and then when are you going to ask for that sale? Because sometimes a lot of us don't actually ask. 
Um, and you know that it's important to ask, obviously in a polite way, but you're building up to that. So make sure, again, think about, can you maybe automate this or is it something that you need to do one-to-one? -one? Um, and then once they are a customer, what's the plan? How do you stay engaged with them? Are you going to run some online events? Are you going to, you know, send them your newsletter? Obviously, if they've uh, opted in, um, think about these different steps. And then finally, think about re-engagement. So um, Facebook are actually quite good at this with their memories. So they, you know, send you that notification this day, 10 years ago, you were uh, in college or celebrating, um, you know, uh, Freshers Week, whatever it might be. So think about the re-engagement and those triggers that you, can, that you can use there to keep them engaged. The third tip is um, understand the metrics for success. So because you have two different teams here, and uh, now in some organizations as well, you might be the one person doing both, but you need to think about uh, what's important. So for the marketing team, is it like the open rates, the click-through rates, the number of leads generated? Um, Danielle is going to talk to us a little bit more about that in, in, a, in a while. Or for the sales team, is it the number of calls um, generated from those leads, of course, the number of deals closed? Um, and sometimes it's hard to put a figure on, on these things. Um, but MailChimp, for example, has some really good um, benchmark data that you can compare your industry against. Um, so it's always a good starting point. And then once you once you have metrics, then you can measure it um, more accurately and then you can refine it and improve. And then number four, um, the reason I guess we invited MailChimp on to this session as well is because they're one of our major uh, integration partners. Um, so it is all about getting those systems talking to each other. And I personally don't like admin. <laughs> um, you know, if you keep the sales process running smoothly behind the scenes, that's even better. And then you just know when you need to follow up um, and how. So um, definitely that is another great way to keep your sales and marketing teams on the same page. And we'll be covering that as well in just um, a couple of moments. So um, there are four tips and maybe food for thought uh, for you to think about. Okay, so we have a question. Um, so true or false? When it comes to email marketing, your subject line is the number one reason why subscribers open your email. So if you want to type it in the chat window there, true or false, we'll just have a quick peek. So this will open up our next conversation. So we have true, true, false, true, true. Okay. Wow, lots more. Yeah, definitely there's a resounding true, true, true. Okay, we've got a false there, another true, true, true. Okay, lots of truths. Lots of so, truths. Yeah. So that, that's the thing. People, I think, sometimes focus very much on one thing. So I'm going to pass you over to Danielle, and she's going to answer, get, tell you the reasons why that's not the number one thing. So the answer is actually false. Exactly. I mean, I think that all of our natural inclination is to say that subject line is the most important thing, but it's actually all about personalizing your email communications um, with the sender. And it's all about the audience. And here at MailChimp, we've made a shift from um, list to audience over um, the past year. And we really believe that that's where everything starts is who are you talking to and how are you personalizing your messages in order to specifically speak to that particular audience. That in line. And so we'll get into a how to later on in today's conversation, but there are several different ways that you can personalize your message and leverage the integration that we have with one page CRM in order to do that. Brilliant. Yep. No, it definitely makes sense. So as you can see from the stats as well, subject line is important, um, but it's not the most important. So that's just what we want to kind of um, just stress a little bit there. Um, so we're going to open up the conversation now um, to discuss what problems SMBs are experiencing with email marketing. So if you've got some questions, definitely um, keep them coming here now. So um, here's a few that uh, we just pulled together from kind of chatting to customers. So um, the first one is sending uh, to a stale list. Um, so Danielle, this can often be a huge problem um, if you're, because your list I suppose, or your audience is the foundation of your campaign. So if, if that's not right, then you're not going to have a successful campaign. So what should you be looking at here? Exactly. You should definitely um, 
draw yourself to MailChimp's audience dashboard. Um, that'll let you know who's subscribing, who's unsubscribing, you know, who's removing themselves um, from your list. And there may be an opportunity um, for you to re-engage um, those individuals in order to get a, a, a more engaged response from them. So maybe email is not the right channel for them. Maybe they are um, prefer like good old snail mail. So maybe they want a postcard. We can absolutely help you send a campaign immediately in one click to those individuals who you have their physical address for. And so there are different ways where you can keep um, your audience um, as up to date as possible. And another way to do that is also via our integration with one page CRM. Once again, you know, if you're constantly utilizing those forms in order to get the most up to date information and also adding new people um, to your audience, then that will also help you keep a fresh list month over month. Brilliant. Yep. That's definitely um, some good, some good um, tips there. So make sure that you're, you're looking at your audience and where they're coming from and who's subscribing, unsubscribing. Yep. Definitely. It makes sense. Um, not getting permission to email in the first place. Um, so I guess consent has always been there, but it's come to the forefront in the EU probably in the last two years uh, due to the GDPR regulation. And I know in Canada as well, they're, they're pretty strict when it comes to this and also parts of the US. Um, and MailChimp has some really good built-in GDPR fields already there. So you can, they're practically ready to go. But is there anything else that uh, customers should be looking or, or our audience should be looking out for uh, when it comes to getting permission? Yeah, you always want to make sure that you have that opt-in option on um, your forms. Once again, it comes back to that forms and you collecting that audience and contact data in order to ensure that you know the proper status for them. Um, GDPR is a huge focus for us here at MailChimp. And so you always want to make sure and we always want to help our users um, be sure that they are remaining GDPR um, compliant. So that's very important to us. And so it starts with when they immediately subscribe to your audience or your list and getting that opt-in and ensuring that you're only sending to those who have subscribed to your newsletter or email communication. Brilliant. Yep. It definitely, it makes sense and it makes life a lot easier as well when it's a template and it's ready to go. Um, the next one was emails not getting past spam filters. And I think somebody had a, this as a question already. Um, so it's a really, this is a really interesting one. So what can you share here with us? So how do we get past those spam filters? Yeah, I think this goes back to the subject line um, conversation that we were kind of having earlier, but I kind of focus on the personalization opportunity there. But let's talk about subject lines and some of the tips that can help you get through those spam filters. You want to be descriptive. You want to ensure that you're direct versus being descriptive and trendy, like summer, you know, sizzling bargains and things like that. It's better just to be direct and to the point and also keeping it short. Um, quite frankly, you know, people don't have a lot of time these days and we're living in a Twitter world where people just, you know, want it in quick sound bites. And so ensuring that you're descriptive, you're keeping it short as well as limiting punctuation. You know, you don't want three, you know, exclamation marks, um, exclamation points. Um, so ensuring that you're also limiting that as well as um, emojis um, and testing, test those subject lines and ensure um, before you launch a campaign that they're going to resonate with your audience. And once again, that starts with personalization. Do you know who these people are? And is there a way for you to whittle that audience down into a cohort so that you are ensuring that you're speaking to them in a way that resonates? Um, to them. So all of these are ways that you can get past those spam filters. Brilliant. Yep. It definitely, it makes sense, especially when they're personalized, keeping the subjects short um, and relevant as well, and not using too many of those buzz, um, buzz terms. Um, and then when another issue people often have is they send a campaign in a rush. So they, they don't test um, and they just kind of send it out and hope for the best. So what would you, what would you recommend here? Absolutely. If you have time and can build in time into your communications plan in order to be able to test your email and preview that, it's so important and you'll be so glad that you did. So hopefully there's someone within your organization or on your team who you can send the test email to. It's always great to A and B test and see um, which subject line performs better. Um, obviously, um, the personalization will help and will always win out over that subject line um, because then people know that you know who they are and you probably have a pre-existing relationship with them in some um, manner. And so, 
Secondly, I would say we just recently launched a subject line helper. And so these tips also live inside the MailChimp app. And we've denoted when you get to that subject line portion of building your campaign, there's these tips sit right there in order to remind you. So I think that it's all about testing, allowing for time to do so, and getting a fresh set of eyes um, there within your organization um, to help ensure that you haven't missed punctuation or misspellings and things like that. All of that contributes to the performance of your campaign. Yes, for sure. And I'm, I'm a firm believer as well in, in fresh eyes. So yeah, send it to somebody else, a colleague. They don't even have to be in the marketing team. Right. Um, you know, it could be your salesperson. It could be someone in finance. Just, yeah, click I love those that links. Idea. I love that. Idea. And to me, that reinforces the point that you kicked us off with was that alignment between sales and marketing. And that's a way to really build relationships. If you share that test link with them, then they know, number one, they have viewership of what you're sending to their contacts. And then number yeah. two, they know that you see them as a trusted um, uh, person in the organization and you all have that alignment. Yeah, for sure. Um, so the next one is writing generic pushy sales, or writing generic or pushy sales email copy. So um, this is something we'll be looking at probably in more detail, but is there any kind of just off the top of your head, Danielle, anything here, just avoid? Exactly. So I think this goes to the point um, that MailChimp is really known as being an email um, automation um, platform. And so, however, we are really transitioning from being that email automation to an all-in-one marketing platform. And so we're really encouraging our users to send um, specific targeted um, messages to, to specific people within their audience. And so um, I think that speaks first to the gen generic, right? Personalization over being generic. Um, you don't want to send out one holistic message. There are some times that call for that. Um, but if you can get personalized and have a specific um, goal in mind for a specific group of people, then that's the ideal scenario. And then pushy sales copy. I mean, a lot of us, you know, I think if we just put ourselves in our audience's shoes, which is always a good way to operate, um, people want to be spoken to in um, a way that resonates with them versus be feeling like they're being sold to. So we always want to avoid that and really just speak to people um, in an organic way. Yes, definitely. Um, I think people don't want to be felt, they don't want to feel like they're being sold to. So that's a really good um, message to, to take from that one as well. Um, and then sometimes you offer, well, I've often received emails that there's lots of buttons on, on the email or in the email and maybe a big, huge header image. Um, so what would you recommend here? Like how many call to actions should you have? Yes, I mean, I think if you can stick to one CTA, that's definitely the way to go. And that comes with having an established marketing strategy on the front end before you um, generate your campaign so that you make sure that whatever you're sending them to, um, whatever that link is, is in alignment with how you're going to judge the performance of the campaign. There's certainly exceptions to this rule. Um, a lot of times I know in our own email communication um, from a MailChimp perspective, we will um, have hyperlinks embedded into the copy. So if people want to know um, more about a particular subject that's brought up in the body copy, we will hyperlink to it, but there'll only be one CTA button within it. Or maybe you'll have links at the bottom to like your social media presence, but that definitely takes a secondary level to your primary CTA. Yes, for sure. I think, yeah, so that's the message there is kind of have one main button, but you can have hyperlinks maybe with, um, with other information, which is, which is a good one. Um, and then the next one is, uh, so number seven is not analyzing campaign reports. I have to hold my hand up. I'm definitely guilty. Um, so up until recently, um, I didn't actually go in and look at the results too much. I didn't focus on them. Um, although when I did, I was pleasantly surprised. Um, when, again, when I compared them against the industry benchmarks. Um, but now I'm going to probably create our own benchmark internally. So that's where we're going to you know, um, position ourselves. But what would you recommend here? I know you're going to cover it as well in more detail, but um, how can we, what, what, what should we be looking for here with the campaigns? Absolutely. Well, the um, average across all industries for open rates when we analyze that within our user base is around 21.33%. 
And so that's um, the average across all industries. But if you want to get more granular and look at your particular industry specifically, we do have um, a resource email marketing benchmarks that can be found within our resources library on MailChimp.com that will break that down into your specific industry and gives you multiple categories, CTR, open rates, bounce rate, um, benchmarks. I encourage everyone um, to reference that as you're looking um, for campaign reports. But it's important that after you launch a campaign that you go back into your MailChimp account and look at our reports tab um, as well as our audience dashboard, it will show you who has and has not engaged and give you opportunities to engage them in different ways. Um, so there's lots of resources available to let you know how you stack up and hopefully you'll continue to learn and optimize and grow um, from those learnings. Yes, for sure. Um, it's definitely a great tool. Um, and it's interesting there as well that the average is. So if you're below the average, you know, you maybe need to look closely or look a little bit closer there. Um, and then the last one is lack of following up. Uh, so in my, um, in my view, there's no real excuse for this. Um, I think especially when your marketing team or if again, if you're that person that, wear many, that wears many hats and you've done all the hard work at the beginning of actually attracting the person to fill out your form, and then you've got their details and then you don't follow up with them. I think that's sometimes um, lots of larger organizations are guilty of this, but it can easily happen as well in SMBs. Um, so is there anything you can recommend here, Danielle, of what we should be doing? Of course, automations, hello. Um, we're doing some really cool things around um, automating um, email and it's really all about saving time so that our users um, can, and your users can save time focusing on the things that really matter to them versus spending time bogged down in our platforms. And so setting up, you know, simple um, automation um, branching within our all-in-one platform can definitely help you automatically follow, follow up. So that's as simple as determining um, branching, like did they respond, did they open or did they not open? And then following up, sending another email within two to three days of them, of the initial deployment of the campaign. And so those are simple things that you can do in order to automatically do it for you so that you don't have to think about it. You don't have to remember all the things. And so um, I definitely recommend that you tap into our um, email automation series and they can be very simple or they can be multivariant. And so I recommend that you have, if you haven't tried it before, try it with a single you know, branch and then go from there. Perfect. Yep. It definitely makes sense. And that combined with um, one page CRM, you know, if you have your form feeding into one page CRM, you know, again, you are setting that automatic um, next action to follow up. So we'll be covering that as well in just a moment. Um, sorry, just back one. Um, great. So um, passing it over to you, Danielle. So how can we help SMBs effectively do email marketing better? Absolutely. I think it all starts with the virtuous marketing cycle. If you are a marketer and are unfamiliar with this, then um, I encourage you to utilize this as the foundation for your marketing strategy to really ensure that you've checked all the boxes before you deployed a campaign. And so these are the um, seven pillars that we believe in um, at MailChimp and that work really nicely with one page CRM. So first it's all about collect. It's all about collecting that contact, that individual data um, and knowing what your um, customers and prospects are or aren't doing or who they are um, so that you can seamlessly synchronize that data from platform to platform. We know that a lot of people are using multiple platforms. They're not just using MailChimp. They're not just using one page CRM. There are a multitude of platforms that you all are utilizing. And so connecting those things in order to collect the data and seamlessly transferring that information will save you time. Um, secondly, then organizing that data when it comes from platform to platform. So utilizing things such as forms with our integration with one page CRM will help you identify certain questions that you can ask your prospects on the front end in order to organize them based on who they are, what industry they're in, um, what their demographic is, what um, what country they're located in so that all these things can help you um, send the right message to the right people at the right time. Thirdly, personalization um, is key. I think we've already touched on that um, earlier, but I can't um, drive it home enough. 
using that information that you're collecting from that form, once again, it all comes back to that collection and how you started with that integration in order to be able to personalize things such as first and last name, or to be able to segment your audience based on what industry they're in can help you get through those spam filters and probably increase engagement like open rates and click-through rates. And then next is testing. Um, A and B testing or multivariant testing is ever so important. Once again, building that time in order to test your campaign so that you can be proactive on the front end and ensure that you have the best performance that's um, possible. And also leverage the relationship with internal um, partners like your sales team or your marketing team, if you're on the sales side, you know, align and lock arms with them and utilize them as a testing ground before you actually launch your campaign. And then segmentation. Um, segmentation is a word that we hear a lot of feedback on at MailChimp. Um, a lot of people are scared of that term. It can be intimidating. And it's simply just being able to filter your audience um, based on who they are or where they're located or what they've done or not done. And so that's all. Just filtering that audience down so that you can send more targeted messages that will increase the performance of your campaign versus doing a bulk email. Can't stress that enough. And then finally launch. When you finally get that gratification, once you've done all of these steps before, you finally get to launch your campaign. You get that Freddie high five in the MailChimp um, platform that we're known uh, for. That's so important. Um, but then after that, it all is about that follow up and that optimization, learning from the campaign that you've most recently launched and checking out the audience dashboard as well as your MailChimp homepage to find out how does this recent campaign compare to your previous campaigns and how can you iterate and pull different levers in order to ensure optimal performance and learning from each campaign in order to get to that um, industry benchmark that we've talked about. So I'll pass it over now um, to Carol so that she can show us what the integration looks like in a demo. Perfect. Um, that's great. Thank you very much for that, Danielle. So I'm just conscious of the time here as well. So I'm going to kind of um, fast forward a little bit, but Sarah is going to be posting um, some links um, to how the integration works for those of you that aren't already familiar. Um, but the first thing the, on Danielle's point is to collect. So you have your web form um, and here it is. So this is it here set up in MailChimp. So let's say John arrives on my website and he fills out my form. So you can make fields as well um, mandatory or not. It's entirely up to you. Um, John Ryan at gmail, let's say, .com. Uh, you can put in the phone number and the industry. So it's good as well to help you with your segmentation is to ask them kind of a, a question that will help you target them more, more specifically. Um, so let's say I'm looking for more info on SEO. SEO, and then um, of course my GDPR. So let's just say yes. Okay, so they've described, they subscribe to my um, list. And because I've been connected with one page CRM, when I reload the page, you see here this, this contact has already been created with, in, with an action already assigned. So this is a, a superb way to make sure that you do not miss out on following up with this particular prospect. And it also pulls in the information. So you know um, the industry he's in, you know where this, this lead came from, it was your web form. So you can customize a few web forms on different pages, different platforms. Um, you can you know, customize this option as well uh, within one page CRM. So that's our MailChimp forms integration. Um, and here I just mentioned that you can customize here what it shows so that next action can be customized and when, also the status, the lead source, um, all of that, any tags as well, um, which you can, be, you can trigger other campaigns from. And then once you have them created in one page CRM, um, they'll also be created over in MailChimp, but you want to make sure that when you move that lead from a lead to a prospect, when you start engaging, you want to make sure that it's, you're getting the most up-to-date information sent over to MailChimp. So here again, using our integration, you can, um, you can easily do that. And it gets updated at um, a time that you choose every single day. So at the, you know, you can, choose to have it at the end of every day is probably a better uh, idea. And then any campaign results to be at the start of every day is usually um, what we would recommend. And once you've um, saved and synced um, your data with MailChimp, um, it takes you over to your, it, all that information then is available within your audience 
dashboard. So um, that's how easy it works. And that makes sure, again, that you're keeping your um, sales and your marketing teams aligned. So I'm just going to pass you to Danielle, who's just going to talk to you a little bit more about those um, other five points about the segmentation um, and also the um, analyzing the results as well. Absolutely. So we'll jump to segmentation now that you've collected and organized your audience um, with those tags and with those custom fields. You come to your audience tab, go to your um, segments uh, tab, and then create a new segment. So here, now that you've collected the industry information, you can come in here and you're on our segmentation um, tab and you can select the criteria underneath merged fields and you will select what industry are you in because you're wanting to send um, information out specifically to your financial industry uh, prospects. And we allow you to be able to preview that segment so that you can validate that the information there is there. Then you can save it. You can name it, and these are our VIP finance um, prospects. And so then you can save that there, and you can immediately send from the segmentation tab and start creating your campaign right there for your email. So within the two section of the campaign builder, you can go in to edit recipients and then select your audience that you want to pull from, as well as your segment there, VIP financial that we just created. So boom, your audience boom your segment and then personalize yay we have a little reminder there and you can use a merge tag in order to decide do you want to go first name last name or both and so then you save that so that everyone gets that personalized message that we talked about on the front end and then you can continue through the flow selecting your from subject and content and then test and launch your campaign secondly we wanted to show you all today the optimization piece and so wanted to show you some quick hits on your MailChimp home, homepage. Once you sign in, you are here. It shows you about your audience. And then it shows you about campaign engagement, which really gives you that open and click through rate that we've discussed throughout today's conversation. And so here you can filter by seven days or the past 30 days, or look at your performance over the past year. So you can see you get a specific number or quantity about opens and clicks, and then you get a percentage about delivered and opened. So this can allow you to see if your performance is continuing to increase or if there's some areas for opportunity. So that's the first place where you can look for optimization opportunities and compare those to the industry book benchmarks that are available in our resources library. And then secondly, the other place you can go to is within our audience tab here. So you can go back to audience, go to that dashboard that we've spoken about multiple times today. You can scroll down to see how many contacts are in your audience and how many subscribes you have. And then come down to this engagement, email marketing engagement section. And I love this one because it allows you in one click to engage with those people who um, sometimes interact with you. You can send them an email again, or you can maybe create a Facebook or Instagram ad or send the postcard that I referred to earlier. It's easy to do in just one click. We allow you to be multi-channel or to send another email to those who may not have engaged. So this will allow you to act on the data um, based on the performance of your most recent campaign. And so that's optimization in order to start that virtuous marketing cycle once again. Brilliant. Um, thank you so much for that, Danielle. Um, I think it's, it, it is really important um, to make sure that you, um, that you are analyzing and know, and that lets you delve in deeper as well to know who your customers are, where they're coming from, how engaged they are or maybe are not. And then you can um, put the steps in place to change that. Yeah, and just to showcase the power of segmentation, we know based on our user data that on average, um, segmented campaigns resulted in 23% higher open rate. So if you're looking to optimize and improve the performance of your campaigns, segmentation and personalization will help you get there, I promise. And then the second set that I wanted to drive home today was um, it also improves your click-through rates at 49% uh, increase um, versus those that are unsegmented or bulk um, mm -hmm. campaigns. So I think this um, really drives the point home of the importance of segmentation and personalization.
Yeah, definitely for sure. Um, no, that's been that's been really great, and um, definitely some key takeaways there. So, just as a recap, Danielle, do you want to just cover those last three the last three takeaways? Yeah, so our last few takeaways here are it's all about the integration between one page CRM and MailChimp. This will allow you to save time and focus on the things that matter most to your business. So seamlessly synchronize that audience data so that you can get that holistic view and then find those individual cohorts, whether it's by industry or location, um, et cetera, whatever is most important to you, utilize that as your criteria for segmentation. Secondly, leverage those merge tags. Um, I think we do a great job at MailChimp of reminding you that. You saw that in the campaign builder today. If you forget to personalize, we have that reminder there for you for that one-on-one -on -one conversation between sales and marketing. And then third, segmentation, segmentation, segmentation are also just filtering your audience. Do that, launch your email, and then utilize the data that's given to you on the back end in order to see if there's an opportunity to re-engage people via another channel, such as postcard or um, Instagram or Facebook ads. Super. Yep. And I, I totally agree as well. Sometimes like email, it may not work. That not, may not be the perfect channel for your audience. So then try other things and that gives you a good avenue to do that as well. So um, that's great. So um, we're going to open up the floor to some questions. So I think the chat was pretty busy. So I'm glad we had Sarah on hand there. Um, so thank you, Sarah. And um, so I think there's a few here. So there was lots of answers to our, Q, to our, to our false question. Um, how does this work with and how is it different to the information available? Um, okay, so let's pick, I'm going to pick some at random. And if there's any that we didn't get back to, we can always follow up with you via email afterwards. So um, somebody here mentioned, let me see the name, uh, Dana mentioned, I sent a campaign by email and included, included it in social media, but the link that was that was supposed that people should open, it didn't work. Is there a way to test this social media link also? Yes, I think that goes back to testing your emails that we talked about before you launch, um, send it to someone within your organization and test every single link, have that person do that. And then that allows you to be able to confirm if maybe your copy and paste wasn't correct. Maybe you left off something when you highlighted it. And so that'll allow you an opportunity. But once you build that campaign in MailChimp, you have those links to include and that you can check. And so I would just encourage you to partner with someone and that can help build that relationship at the same time as making sure that you don't have any mistakes in your email campaign. Yeah, for sure. I think it, usually it probably was maybe needed to be just du double checked that one more time or triple checked before it went out. Um, a, a good question here as well. What happens? So what about when you buy marketing data, like email address, email lists? How does this work with MailChimp and how is it different to their information available in public and how we reach out? Yeah, so we are not proponents at MailChimp of buying lists. Um, we encourage people to utilize forms as, um, as a primary functionality. And actually, forms are the number one feature that people utilize first when creating a new account at MailChimp. You would think it would be email, um, but it's actually forms. And that's because we want you to create and grow that audience in an organic way versus kind of buying your way there. Um, we don't recommend that because that's probably going to decrease the performance of your campaigns because these people don't have any exposure to your brand more than likely. And so that's going to um, impact the performance of your campaign. So we don't recommend that. Okay. Um, good to note. Um, another question here. Uh, is it easy to send a one-off email to a list member in MailChimp? So, it, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it is pretty easy. If you just go into the contact profile, um, there's an opportunity for you to send a one-on-one -on -one, um, email there within the contact profile section. And so, um, although, you know, depending on your uh, audience or list size, obviously that can be very time consuming, but if there's mm -hmm. someone that you have been, um, uh, individually want to um, contact, then that's certainly an option for you to do. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, it depends. If it's just that one email, I, I would recommend maybe to create a template either in one page CRM or in your own email client and send it that way. Um, because MailChimp is, the impact is sending it for mass email marketing. So that's, you want to leverage um, the audience and the results as well. So um, there's some more questions there. Um, so lots of people looking for the recording. 
Um, doo -doo -doo. So another, a good question here as well is, can companies block opens? So from time to time, I get responses from people that show that they did not open my mass email. So can a company actually, like a company or the person? I think it's probably the person more so, but can, I suppose companies probably can block domains as well. Absolutely. I think there's allow and deny list um, that exists um, where people can um, do that at a company level or at an individual level based on their own email settings and preferences. So I think once again, in today's environment where email is just, hey, it's a cluttered space, right? Let's all acknowledge and be transparent about that. People can um, do that, especially if you've bought a list or something like that, then they, they may not want it and may be able to filter that out. Or it may go through um, the spam filter. And so once again, you may want to refine your, um, the contents of your communication so that you get through those barriers. Yes, for sure. And uh, one thing here as well in One Page CRM, and I think it actually came from recommendation from MailChimp a long time ago, was um, always try and send from a personalized email rather than a generic. So rather than sending from support at onepagecrm.com, we send from Carmel G at onepagecrm.com. So that as well would, um, would increase and hopefully, you know, make it look more personalized rather than looking like a mass um, marketing email. So maybe try something like that. And um, that was actually a question came from a girl called Danielle as well. So from one <laughs> Danielle to another. Um, so somebody just mentioned about the benchmark data seems to be uh, about a year old. Um, so a year old data though is, is not that old. Um, but does MailChimp have any plans maybe to bring out some revised, some updated stats on that? Or maybe they haven't changed too much in a year? Yeah, we definitely have plans to um, look over that year over year, and I'll definitely bring that feedback back to the team as well. We currently are revising a lot of our stats online over the summer, so hopefully you'll see some updates there. Um, additionally, we have um, recommendations from our data science team that have been deployed. So depending on um, what package level you're in, you can also um, get recommendations based on the industry you're in and benchmark data within the app. And so I would definitely encourage you to maybe call our support team or chat or email with them um, to find out if you're able to access that by like upgrading um, your account because they're are a lot of data uh, science enhancements that we're deploying right now that could provide you with that real-time information in comparison to other people across your industry and tapping into our 11 billion um, users that exist in our platform. Wow, yeah, data science, it's so powerful. So yep, definitely, we'll, we'll stay tuned for that. Um, Jim just had a question and I think Sarah maybe answered it already. Uh, where do we put this web form? So, um, so Jim, yeah, you, you would put it into your website. Um, and so there's a link uh, when you go into your web form um, in the settings of your web form, there is just a, 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 like a snippet of code that you need to paste into your website. And once you do that, then it literally is connecting MailChimp forms to your website. And then you can easily connect MailChimp forms to one page CRM and um, then back over to MailChimp. So uh, we can definitely follow up with some videos on that one as well. Uh, brilliant. I think Sarah's already got there. Well done, Sarah. Um, leaving. I uh, can't really follow your post on marketing. Thanks for the session. Okay, so great. Uh, da -da -da. Um, I believe someone asked how can they get feedback about their email content. I think that was early on. Yeah. I just want to address that. Um, we definitely just launched surveys and I don't know if everyone's aware of that, but it definitely is an opportunity for you to include surveys in your email campaign so that you can get real time feedback from your audience about what is and is not working so that you can market um, smarter. So I would encourage people to go to MailChimp.com and search surveys and you can get more information about that particular feature and how you can get feedback about your content so that you can also refine it based on what your audience is telling you. Oh, super. Um, I actually think I got an um, email from MailChimp the other day um, with a survey. So um, it's good to know that you're using your own tools to collect and um, to like to collect data. And then I think we'll just take one last question here. Um, Victoria asked, what is the timetable for an average campaign? So it's probably a bit of an open-ended question, um, but I suppose maybe from when you send it, how long should you give it before you maybe analyze the results? Is that maybe, Victoria, if you're still online, maybe is that what you're referring to there? Uh, let's just double check. 
Uh, maybe Victoria, may, she may or may not be with us, but just in, maybe just to answer that question from that angle. Um, so how long, so I sent a campaign today. How long do I say, okay, is it two weeks, 30 days that says, okay, um, yes, that was a success. It was 20% open rates, 2% click rates. Um, what do you think, Danielle? I definitely think waiting a week. Um, a week? It's so funny. I was just having that conversation internally for our own um, like campaign that recently launched. I think allowing um, at least a week for um, that message to penetrate um, with people, but you can certainly go and check. I mean, look, I'm I'm also guilty of going in and looking at performance like two or three days after, like how many clicks have we gotten? How many page views um, have been delivered from that CTA? And so obviously nothing's stopping you from going and taking a peek before that, but I would probably give it um, at least, you know, three business days before looking and then um, a week um, to respond and optimize. Perfect. Okay. That's noted here as well. So that's a good tip. Um, actually, we have two or three more questions and we, if you're okay, Danielle, we might just uh, yeah. answer those as well. So um, good question as well from Jim. He asked, when sending an email blast, how can we get notified that the email has been opened on the fly so we can reply while the, while the prospect is hot? Oh, that is something that I don't think currently exists um, with us, but it certainly um, is an area for opportunity with some partners in the future that we're in conversation with that I won't disclose right now. Um, but that is something that I think would tie in nicely um, with just uh, parity between um, one page CRM and our CRM capabilities within MailChimp. And so that's not something that I think we can do um, right now but it's definitely something that I think could bring a lot of value. So thank you for adding spotlight on that. And I'll take that feedback um, back to our team. Yep. That's, that's really good feedback. And yeah, strike as the irons strike when the irons hotter, so they say. And Sean has a, a brilliant question here as well. Um, because I think in the past people used to put lots and lots of images in emails. Like I've got them in the past and I've noticed it's changed. Um, so Sean's question is for B2B, which works best plain text or graphic template? I think plain text personally in order to maintain a certain level of um, professionalism, but we certainly have recently um, launched like dynamic uh, content within our app that allows um, the imaging um, that surface to be customized according to what that particular person has engaged with or showed interest in. And so if you have, once again, personalized information about what that person's already interested in, then graphic could make sense. I think it's all situational. Um, and if you already have information about that particular contact or that partic um, particular segment of your audience of whether or not you have relevant graphics to align with what you already know they have interest in or what or who they are or what they're doing. Um, but if you don't have that information, I think that plain text is the way to go. But if you do have that, then graphics make sense. But I think people can also overdo it with graphics. So keeping it to a minimum is also important. Great. Yeah, that definitely, definitely makes a lot of sense. Um, so Victoria actually got back. Um, so her question was, was related to um, the average timetable for successful campaigns. What about drip? So I think maybe, um, Victoria, do you mean um, like how long you should leave between each email in a drip campaign? Is that maybe what you're referring to? Again, yeah. I would say that's very situational. It's, there isn't kind of one rule fits all for that one, but do you have any kind of uh, average or generic maybe rules there at MailChimp that you should leave it two days, three days? I know um, within our like email automation platform, we have it set up be um, between like one, seven days or 30 days. So right now that's the capability I know for some of our um, automation email builds is that those are the particular timeframes that you can do. Um, so I think it's situational depending on if you're doing an offer right, that expires within the month, then maybe you need to make sure that that drip campaign is then followed up within um, two weeks so that they still have another two weeks to respond before that offer expires. So I agree with you, um, Carmel, that this is an purely situational and that it should be addressed on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on what your target message is and what kind of action you're trying to get as a result of that. Yep, definitely. It, it makes sense. So, um, Victoria, if you even want to pop us over an email, um, Sarah will post our details there in, in a moment, but pop us over an email and maybe tell us a little bit more about 
that drip campaign that you're sending and um, we'll get back to you in the in the coming days as well with with some more info um, on that and anyone else as well if you have any questions um, I'm sorry if we missed any of your questions during today's session but we'll definitely um, we'll get to them at the very end so I'm just um, popping in our email addresses there in the in the chat window um, I think I got it there sorry uh, perfect so I think um, I think we're going to leave it at that. Um, stay tuned, keep an eye on your email because we will be sending you a copy of this recording. And I'd like to um, say a huge thank you to Danielle for coming today and um, joining us on this session. We've had a, a really interactive one and definitely we've had a, a really great live audience as well. So um, thank you to, to Danielle and thank you to our live audience. And of course, thank you to Sarah for doing an awesome job as always um, on the chat. So keeping everything going there as well. So um, for me, Carmel Granahan, uh, I'd like to say thank you. And um, thanks everyone. Keep in touch. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.